My name is Emmanuel Catan. I'm the director of the Alliance Programme, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's event. Can the EU lead the fight against climate change? This event is the third in a series of six debates on the future of Europe, jointly organized by the European Institute, the Columbia Global Centers Paris, and the Alliance Programme. A debate about climate change is always a timely event, but our discussion comes at a particularly auspicious time, one year after the launch of the EU Green Deal, and at a time also when all the eyes of the world are turned to Europe uh, for leadership on climate change mitigation, and in the midst, of course, of a major political transition in the United States. To help us navigate these issues, we brought together a high-powered panel of experts and we are honored to have Professor Adam Tooze as our moderator. Adam Tooze holds the Shelby Cullum Davis Chair of History at Columbia University and serves as director of the European Institute. He is the author of numerous books, the most recent of which is Crashed, um, how, a decade, how a Decade of Financial uh, Crisis Changed the World, He's currently working on Shutdown, the Global Crises of 2020, which will come out next year, and Carbon, which will be published in 2023. Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. It is indeed a pleasure to be here. And as you say, the topic could not be more timely. It is an urgent moment in uh, the history of Europe, of the United States, and in climate politics more generally. And it's a real pleasure to welcome the extraordinary panel that we've been able to bring together for this event. Um, let me first introduce uh, Enrico Leite, uh, is the Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs at Sciences Po uh, and President of the Jacques Delors Institute. He will be known to you all, I'm sure, as the Prime Minister of Italy uh, between 2013 and 2014 and has also held a number of senior cabinet positions uh, and a position in the European Parliament. Uh, alongside Enrico Leite, we have Laurence Tubiana, uh, the CEO of the European Climate Foundation and Chair of the Board of Governors at the French Development Agency. She was France's Climate Change Ambassador and Special Representative for COP21, in other words, one of the key architects of the 2015 Paris Agreement, whose five-year anniversary we are uh, have reached uh, this year. Welcome to you, Laurence. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the next uh, speaker I'll introduce is Jason Bordoff, who is the Founding Director uh, of the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia. He served pre pre prior to that in the Obama administration as a special assistant to the president and senior director for energy and climate change on the National Security Council. So a brilliantly informed insider on the American side. And finally, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the panel my colleague, Alex Halliday, who is director of Columbia University's uh, Earth Institute. He's also spearheading the creation of a climate school at our university. Before joining Columbia, he was professor of geochemistry and dean of science and engineering at the University of Oxford. So welcome to the panel. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're going to uh, all, uh, engage in a free-flowing conversation and we invite the audience to contribute by putting their questions into the Q&A chat, the Q&A function, not the chat. I will monitor those as we go along and put some of those questions to our panel. We'll see how we go if we transition later on at the end, towards the end of our session, towards a, a flat out exchange between the audience and the panel. That would be great too. But we thought we would start by asking um, our two representatives from Europe uh, the, today, uh, Enrico and Laurence, to bring us up to date on how they view the development of Europe's climate policy since the inauguration of the Green Deal, and perhaps particularly in light of the important, at least they seem outwardly important, compromises reached last week on Europe's new goal to reach 55% reduction by 2030. Enrico, would you like to give us your impressions first of where we stand, and then I'll, then I'll bring Laurence in. Yes, of course. First of all, thank you very much for having me. And, and it's fantastic being here and with this fantastic panel and alongside Laurence Tobiana. Um, I think it was, um, we, we had a crucial moment uh, during the spring. That was for me, the crossroad 
for the topic, because the big risk was to uh, put a priority, and the priority uh, was at that time to say, okay, we have to save economy, jobs, and uh, maybe uh, climate change, environment will go second. And that was the big risk at that time. And I think uh, the, the great choice made by the European Commission and the European Council between uh, May and July and the uh, decision uh, taken by the European Council uh, uh, 17th until uh, 21st of July was, I think, the right one. So the, it was the, the decision to combine the two priorities and to say uh, we had as main flagship of this commission, the Ursula von der Leyen Commission started in December last year, and the, the flagship was the uh, Green New Deal. Uh, and, uh, and then we said uh, in, in July, uh, now there's the big priority on the, how to react to the recession, and uh, they decided to combine the two priorities, so to have the relaunch by the Green New Deal. And I think that was the crossroad. Uh, now the agreement uh, last week, I think it was uh, I have to say, not less important, but uh, in my view, it was a little bit given for granted. Uh, the, the key point was the opposition of Hungary and Poland, but it was for other reasons. Uh, then the big decision, of course, uh, to put the, the, the figure 55 as the uh, important figure and the important mission objective. But now the most important point is to start and is to implement the agreement because the agreement is enormous. And the, uh, what is, I think, very important, and I stop here, is the tool that we invented at the European uh, level because the tool that the European Council, July 21st, invented, this Corona bond plus the taxation uh, for GAFAM uh, and other uh, issues like, for instance, carbon or other issues that uh, will be uh, at the, the very core of, of this new uh, tool is something completely new, is new money, and this new money will be spent for uh, a new development, a green development. So I am optimistic. I think this year, 2020, uh, was a very risky year for the Green New Deal, and we overcame the obstacle. Thank you, Enrico, for that optimistic view and assessment. Um, very interesting as a historian to understand how you saw, as it were, those critical moments unfolding this year. Laurence, as one of the parents inspiring the Paris 2015 agreements, how do you see Europe's uh, position now five years on? Um, building on, on what Enrico said, just remind, we have to remind us that the affectio societatis for Europe uh, and of course that translated into European election two years ago now, was really based on, uh, and in particular because young voters came in, uh, which was the first time, saying uh, in a way, we, we want a greener Europe to believe in Europe. So that was a mandate that von der Leyen received. So Green Deal is a very political element. It's not something like a technocratic only, sort of number of directives that in a way will be developed over the next six months and uh, in particular the climate law. But just to remind us that this is a condition for this commission, the parties that want to support Europe, including the Conservative Party, which is interesting, uh, really building up on the Green Deal is a condition to maintain Europe with a semblance of unity. And that, of course, that has translated as well in the response to the crisis and of course the issuing of bonds, uh, in particular the green bonds, and the idea that there is something different into the way the budget will be uh, developed. The second element I think is important is that the budget and the green recovery fund or, or the just transition fund, uh, which was finally agreed uh, on the 10th and 11th of December, uh, which is a massive financial element, uh, 1,700 billions uh, is, uh, has a, f a strong component on climate action. It's 30% minimum. Uh, and now more and more a condition that it has to relate to taxonomy and the, the exclusion list that is coming in, of course, with a big discussion on gas, we will certainly come in in the discussion later on. Uh, but something which is, uh, again, that the first time 
we have such an important element on climate across the different sectors. And you see now on industry policy, state aid, competition policy, union market, uh, agriculture, even if it's just far away, um, uh, transport, of course, and buildings. Uh, so everything uh, has to have this climate component, including, of course, a big effort, which is to close down the coal power plants and the coal mines in Europe. Uh, and the third element is, uh, you know, it's interesting in the discussion we will have on the relation between US and EU on climate. And, and you know, as we, we put that in the climate, uh, in the Paris Agreement on climate, uh, this necessity to have this revision because of, again of the learning process and new technologies, et cetera, that the offers uh, of course before the agreement was concluded in December, 2015, required an, an increase in the in the commitments and that's why the 2020 dates was set up and that's why it was really important for eu leadership to come in with a new proposal we could not have had uh, a standing europe for climate without a 55 percent which is a minimum and we know that the parliament in particular including the conservative party has asked for more than that so it's a both a, an internal element that is re related with the citizen appreciation in european societies like something between 60 and 70 percent of citizens in europe wants to have a more intense climate action and on the other side the fact that for international soft power it was needed to in a way fulfill the paris agreement requirement which was to come with and a, a scale contribution, which of course very few countries has done at least this year. And we can discuss China and Japan, et cetera, others. But, so I think this is a, a, a we have to understand, what, I don't want to be too long for this first round, but climate change is playing a role, climate action, the, the, move, the youth movement in Europe, the citizen interest, um, very, very sort of probably different, even if I understand that US things are moving fast. Uh, it's that there is a constituency for climate action, both at the business level, the local authorities level, the citizen, uh, which is really entirely different than five years ago. And that's why I think we have to, in, the, this important as um, Enrico said, the council was important, but mostly for the rule of law type of compromise but mostly because it comes as a result of a huge movement in the, city, in the European societies. And that I think is giving a, a different light of this engagement. And for me, this 55%, and again, the council has no legislative powers, that would be the parliament with the commission, et cetera. So we'll see certainly um, new, new directions, but I, I, I really, we, we have to understand the political element in it, which is very strong in my view, very important. I think that's fantastically interesting. And if you'll permit me, could I sharpen it and tell me if this, as it were, headline or slogan would be would be unfair. But in some sense, is it Europe's answer to the populism, the spectre of populism? Um, as director of the EI a couple of years back, it was difficult to run a panel without people wanting to debate the issue of populism. Enrico, obviously, Italy was one of the polities in Europe that was seen by centrists and people committed to the EU project as in danger of being overwhelmed by the forces of populism. Would it be reasonable to say that as a paraphrase, Laurence, that you see it in part of as the as a creative, not simply a repressive yeah. or dismissive mm -hmm. response, but in fact a positive and creative response? I do think so. I don't know what Enrico think because we haven't had the chance to discuss that. But certainly uh, the mobilization, and, and we, I, I just witnessed that, the mobilization of the people going to vote for European election was against the far right, but for something. It was not against something. So the identity politics we see playing in, in Europe at large, you see that of course the far right takes climate, it's a polarized issue anyway, huh? maybe less than in US by, by far. But still, there is extreme right AFD in Germany, mostly there, a little bit in Netherlands. You see that there is an anti-climate group, but it's very, very, in finally relatively small. Mm. Whereas the, the positive identity, we want an ecological transition in Europe, is a factor of unity. We have 
we have developed studies, very interesting studies on the fragmentation of European societies across the main countries in Europe, uh, including Italy, Poland, etc. And you see as a unique factor that unite people that can see very much anti-system or, or very far away or more liberal. They see that the ecological transition is a, it, it may be a unifying factor. And that I think the politician begin to understand that. Not all of them, I must say, but some of them. And that's why I think this commission, which is very political, has understood that totally. That's why they want to address directly the European citizens through all this consultation, because they feel this, they can find a constituency for Europe. Exactly. I, that's my interpretation. But I don't know, Enrico, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, my, 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 my point is that we, I, I agree with, uh, with Laurence. I think we have to come back a little bit to the political environment and the mood uh, for the European elections 19. Mm -hmm. We were in the, at the top of uh, Trump Brexit period. And uh, some narrative was saying that uh, after Brexit, after Trump, now it's time for Europe to change. Mm -hmm. And so the expectations were for uh, a good success at European election for populists. In reality, uh, the uh, electoral result was, I think, uh, characterized by two main points. The first one was the unexpected higher turnout, because we were at 41% in uh, 14, and then we get 50.5%. Uh, and that was the first time after uh, the uh, first election after 79, the first time that we had uh, a relaunch of the, uh, an increase of the turnout, an increase uh, at, at 10 point level, that's enormous. And the second point was uh, the uh, very bad score of the populist. They had very good results in uh, uh, Italy and in France but Europe is uh, 27 countries. So uh, at the European level, they are uh, very marginal. Uh, so uh, I think what Laurence said uh, is very important is the fact that this commission has a big uh, push by uh, this young participation and this young participation also because of the green uh, flag. Uh, this is why I think what is happening today and the big risk we uh, we had uh, in spring, uh, and and the obstacle that we decided to overcome, is something very important. And now we we have to work uh, to avoid frustration, uh, to avoid frustration, to be very good in applying what we have decided, and to keep the flag of the title of our today's webinar, the leadership of the European Union and the world, because. We know very well that it is not enough that the European Union is doing, is having good results because it is not enough for world uh, results. So we need a European Union united and working as the European Union did, and Laurence knows very well, in 15 in, in Paris. That's just fascinating. I was tempted to invert our title and say it's not so much Europe leading on climate as climate leading Europe or at least enabling a particular group of politicians to lead Europe in the direction they want to go in. I mean, Alex, uh, Jason and I are all stuck over on this side of the Atlantic and obviously the political events all around us cannot but preoccupy us. So in light, I think of what uh, Laurence and Enrico have given us this, I think interestingly political reading of the, the Green Deal, it's, it's I won't, I'm not going to resist the temptation to ask Jason how he reads uh, our election here in terms of the climate issue. Um, do you have a similar reading of, of how it played this year? Was it a way for the Democrats to lead America back to a center ground? Um, or is that perhaps a too optimistic reading of this last election? Uh, well, thanks, it's great to be with everyone here and, uh, and, and do wanna just echo what we just heard. The, focus in the next generation recovery package on green energy, the target of 55%, it's incredibly important and exciting. So kudos to our friends across the Atlantic for the elevated ambition. I think here in the US, uh, clearly we have a divided electorate. There um, are political divisions around this issue, but I think it is notable 
how central a role climate change played in this election. And if you look at President-elect Biden's agenda, go look at his transition website. You'll see a button in the upper right-hand corner called priorities. And there's only four things there. And one of them is climate change. I think that's significant for how climate change will be elevated as a priority. So that's point one. The second point is if you kind of click through and read what's on the website about climate change or even how he talked about it in the campaign, climate change is, is centrally related to the other priorities on that, on that drop-down menu, which are recovery, uh, economic recovery, dealing with the pandemic and racial justice. And so the lens through which much of climate action is going to be viewed is how to think about uh, climate action in ways that invest in, in, in stronger economic recovery and particularly at a time when government interest rates are so low now and, and borrowing rates are negative in real terms. Now's the time to make investments that not only get the economy back on its feet but pay dividends in the long term, particularly on challenges like climate change. Last point, the, what I found interesting watching the transition play out, I thought it was notable and I'm sure intentional that, um, that President-elect Biden's climate envoy was announced not as part of his environmental team, which I think is announced coming soon, but as part of his national security team. And having someone of Secretary Kerry's stature um, and, and experience uh, elevating the role of climate change in US foreign policy, including but not limited to, of course, climate diplomacy and, and re-entering Paris and elevating ambition next year in Glasgow, I think is very uh, important. So the, there are, it seems more likely than not, though not certain that the Senate will stay in Republican hands, that if that's the case, that will constrain uh, some options, but I, I think there's still a decent amount that can be done. There are areas where you can get bipartisan agreement, I hope, on deploying some uh, stimulus dollars, fiscal stimulus, which is going to be needed toward support for, for clean energy. There is support across the aisle on energy R&D and innovation, and we're going to need a lot more of that. And then, of course, there are many tools that the administration has with its existing uh, regulatory authority, particularly but not limited to the Environmental Protection Agency, regulations on emissions from power plants and cars and trucks that can be used to help um, to help set an ambitious target for what might happen in 2030. And then, as I said, all the tools of foreign policy, also an area where the executive branch has significant authority. And I think there you'll see, I was part of a group of um, experts and some people who had worked under President Obama who put together something called Climate 21. And it was an effort to sort of lay out agency by agency how to think about organizing federal departments to prioritize climate, including in, in, in foreign policy. And um, I think you're gonna see a much stronger effort there. You know, obviously it's true for the EPA or for the Department of Energy, but even the agencies that may not in the past have thought of climate as central to their role, you're gonna see an effort now to really think harder and more creatively and elevate the role that climate plays when we're thinking about housing and urban development, we're thinking about the role of the Treasury Department with debt relief, multilateral finance, tax policy, on and on across the federal government. And I think that um, I think that will be exciting to watch. Yeah, if anyone's listening and curious about this, I highly recommend the Climate 21 website. Simply, if you're interested in how the machinery of American government works, because it's literally a blueprint as to how to parachute teams of people into big complex American governmental departments and actually make them do things. And it uses an extraordinary language. It's like reading a Marine Corps operations manual for amphibious operations. They use this language of landing zones. It's an it's a extraordinary document. If you're at all curious about how not the West Wing of fantasy, but the West Wing of actual practice works, go check it out. It's really very interesting. Alex, you... You took a risk, it strikes me, thinking about this now. You moved from the UK to the United States into this maelstrom here from a country which has sort of somewhat surprisingly, I think, emerged as a pioneer of the decarbonization of at least electric power generation to a country where the politics are so fraught. How do you read the, the perhaps that triangle at this moment? Also from the vantage point of somebody which of course we particularly have an interest in trying to engineer an intellectual synthesis around these problems uh, at this moment. I think it's fair to say that the um, UK has been a very strong leader in the past in terms of understanding climate change and taking action on it, uh, particularly in terms of having um, you know, some kind of legal framework uh, that binds parliament to action on climate. Um, ahead of anybody else actually doing this. So there were that whole um, establishment of that, the establishment of all of that was an amazing achievement for the UK going forward. 
um, the you know the, the degree to which um, they will maintain that momentum of leadership, I don't know going forward. I mean, Boris Johnson talks, talks a good talk about how he wants to um, pursue a, a green agenda for the UK. There's bipartisan support for that. Um, and at the same time, the UK is facing some serious economic issues uh, going forward, dealing with a pandemic still and uh, facing Brexit. So how that'll play out for them, uh, you know, isn't, isn't particularly clear. But I do think the Glasgow COP is an opportunity for the UK to sort of uh, help um, make, maintain its momentum in terms of providing uh, some level of global leadership in this area. The most exciting thing, of course, of all, uh, is actually this opportunity for America to re-enter the global agenda as a leader in climate change um, uh, policy and, and strategy and um, the opportunity to actually build very strong links. I think there are really interesting opportunities given uh, without knowing exactly where, um, what um, Biden is thinking, or Jason probably knows better than I do, but you might think that given the geopolitical landscape, uh, forming, rebuilding ties with Europe right now might seem a very sensible thing to do, uh, partly because a lot of uh, traditional ties with NATO, etc., have been somewhat damaged and frayed over the last few years. And so there's got to be some rebuilding of diplomacy and working together anyway. Uh, uh, but also it's, you know, if you really want to have an impact, it strikes me that working with Europe uh, would achieve a phenomenal advantage in terms of being able to provide leadership for the rest of the world uh, going forward. So I think there are, there are wonderful opportunities um, there. I think both sides of the Atlantic have got to confront um, um, this massive issue that we face, that it's, you know, we, you know, we talk about what would the Green Deal mean, the European Green Deal mean, uh, or any kind of solution in America uh, as well. Um, and of course, you think about renewables, you think about electric vehicles, you think about uh, carbon taxes at the borders, maybe, or whatever you're going to end up doing. Uh, you think about trying to bring in negative emissions, planting trees and all that sort of it. But actually, if you do the sums of what's really needed to achieve that 1.5 degrees and no more, it's massive. And so it's and the impact that has to be achieved really fast uh, in terms of changing industry, changing uh, energy sector, etc., and changing and carrying people with you and dealing with the, the massive issues of the disenfranchised communities who are suddenly going to be left behind because they're you know, they work in the coal industry or whatever, you know, that has the chance to totally upset everything in, the, in a democratic uh, organization, you know, that is absolutely massive. And so I do think that there's a lot of thought got to be given to it. It's fine to talk about, we're going to put a trillion dollars into this, but actually how, you know, in terms of um, uh, making that transition and taking money that maybe you've been using for farming in Europe in the past, you're now going to use it for energy. Um, and, and the transition and communities, but actually thinking about how that will really work in a practical way and getting all the automotive, automotive industry on board, etc. I mean, that's a, a big, big ask. And I think that I, I'm nervous about the fact that we're achieving so much politically, but I don't know whether we've really figured out how we're going to make this work practically. So but maybe I might ask Laurence to, to respond because if there is any advanced economy which has, as it were, witnessed a, uh, an upsurge of popular discontent uh, more or less obliquely related to a carbon tax. It is, after all, France, or at least it's understood to be that. Uh, this may be a crude misunderstanding from the outside, but I'm referring to the Gilets jaunes protests in which you have one of the climate leaders in Europe, uh, the hosts of the 2015 conference, attempting to raise the price of fuel and running into a storm of public opposition. To me, this relates to the more general question of what it is that we mean by leadership and what it means in particular for democracies, a theme which I think is also going to assume more and more space in the transatlantic conversation as the Biden team comes in, what it means for us to lead, how credible can we be, how do we establish credibility as leaders, um, because we can't simply do it by authoritative fiat, right? Which has its own problems of stabilizing 
but ultimately it's at the whim of the absolute. This is a classic. It's called it's called original sin in the public finance literature. You can't bind an unbound sovereign very effectively. But what do you do with democratic polities, which are as divided potentially as ours are? I take, I understand, Laurence, your point that there is a constituency in Europe which is young and dynamic and promising, and you can see why politics will swarm around that. But as Alex is reminding us, there are also there is also the risk. There is not just the risk. There is the reality of groups who feel disenfranchised and for whom the blessings of a carbon tax and the gradual movement away from cheap diesel fuel are far less than evident. And in the United States, of course, they're front and center. You don't have to talk very long to European diplomats about the transatlantic relationship for them to tell you, well, it's good until 2024 and no further. Um, and I've heard this verbatim from several people. Uh, it's good until 2024. <coughs> but perhaps, Laurence, you can give us your take on the Gilets yeah. Jaunes phenomenon, the specifically European problem of leadership there. Hmm. Of course, that was a very sort of huge impact and, and huge shock, uh, still not uh, totally absorbed by, by the French society. Um, what is really interesting is, uh, you said obliquely linked to uh, climate policy, uh, but at the center, the, the origin of the movement a particular sort of petition, a lady who launched uh, a big, uh, a big subscription for, and, and she, when she, dis, she she was saying the carbon tax is unfair because it uh, it has a regressive impact on modest households because they can't they can't find an alternative and because of course the price of the energy for a, a modest household, a modest income household is much higher than for, of course, a well-off person, which you don't care about this one cent or five cents increase in price. But then the same people, uh, the same lady, by the way, which is a remarkable woman, by the way, uh, said, we are not against ecological policy. We, we are against unfairness. We are for justice. And that's what uh, Al um, Alex was saying. If you don't uh, integrate in what this enormous change is, this very, very deep transformation, uh, really, uh, uh, really uh, decrease emission by something like between five or seven percent a year, which is more or less what she's needed by 2030 and, and beyond that, is an immense transformation of the economy in every, everywhere. And that's not the fact that the authoritarian regime can deliver that, I'm, I'm not sure either. But that the question of social justice is will be, and from the start now, is an essential piece of the, not only of the acceptability, but I don't like this word, but because of citizen involvement in the decision. So by the way, and because of the yellow vest, uh, Macron finally accepted the suggestion for some of the yellow vests that came to him to say, we, we want to have an, a, a discussion on climate policies that are really putting social justice at the front and center. Well, we, we know that now, I, I was co-chairing this exercise with another colleague, uh, with the citizen who have been chosen for um, trying to identify what could be for them fair climate policies to reduce emission by 40% for 2030 for France, given the fact that, as you know, the electricity in France is by 75% still nuclear. So, and, and the result is really impressive in every element, and they are very ambitious in their, in their on the car policy, on the transport policy, on the building renovation, et cetera. But they want that every time the compensation or the support or the, or the fairness. That's why they want that flights are taxed and not only cars. They want that the price of renovation is not cannot be absorbed by, again, low-income households, so to really have a, a, a transfer for them. So I do think I have two lessons out of this. One is you can't just put the climate policy from the top with one instrument. So the carbon pricing illusion, uh, it's useful. Of course, it's useful to have prices right. But if you don't at the same time, and that's a problem for the 55%, and you have seen the impact assessment of the commission say, if we do that only by extending the, the carbon market, we will have huge regressive impact on the income of household. 
whereas we should have the citizen as citizen in an active having agency for this climate policy to develop. So it means that we have to evolve in the way our democracy function for social change. This is about social change. So if you don't give citizen a voice, a capacity to decide at local level and even at national level, you can't, you, you, we will not delivering this, this transformation. And you will have always the lobbies incumbents say, we cannot do that now. That's exactly what is happening in many countries, including my country in France now. So I think the, the notion of having the citizen as actors in the transformation is a condition for getting such a, a huge and deep transformation. Henry, uh, Jason, do you want to come in? Yeah, I was just going to quickly comment on that. Um, uh, we've done a lot of work on, uh, at the Center on Global Energy Policy and carbon tax design. So just the you know the foot the, the footnote that whether a carbon tax is progressive, regressive. I mean, all of that depends entirely on what you do with the revenue. So it's hard to distinguish the policy instrument from the use of the revenue in terms of its regressivity. I think the broader point, right, echoing what Alex said, I do think we need to think much harder about the political economy barriers to more ambitious climate action. And a big piece of that is gonna be who the losers are, mm -hmm. not from what we've seen so far, which is a modest carbon price or even a decline in coal in some you know, OECD countries, but large scale transformation of the global energy sector. If, we, if, if you imagine what happens to the global energy system if we get on track with well below two degrees, which we're nowhere close to being today, what does that look like? And, and as you know, you know, it's not just not building new coal plants. If we run the existing fleet of global coal plants to the end of their normal economic life, we blow through the Paris climate goals. You're talking about retiring existing infrastructure early that has wide scale economic impacts and not just in the US where, you know, 50, 60,000 people work in the coal industry or in Europe, but a country like India where half a million people work as coal miners, uh, another million I think work for Indian railways, the largest civilian employer and coal provides nearly half of the firm's freight revenue and subsidizes the cost of passenger rail. Um, it's enormously disruptive as a matter of, of, of economic policy. And I think we, uh, people who are doing climate policy, like all of us, need to think harder and work with people doing economic development and economic policy to think about what uh, a more rigorous uh, set of solutions is like. Because I'm afraid if we don't take that seriously enough, that, that, that those political barriers will actually make it harder to move ambitiously on climate. I see Alex, you've you've unmuted. Do you want to come in on this point? No, I just think that's 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 a massively important part that actually we need to we, we need to move really fast. And I think you know, I mean I know we've got these targets to get things done by a certain amount of time, but the the, the we we keep talking at some level. I, I know this sounds like I'm I'm uh, you know engaging in advocacy, but we sort of we talk a lot about this, and actually the motion has been relatively slow in terms of actually getting companies and governments to really change what they're doing. And I think the, this is where I think the green, I mean, it's been really impressive seeing the European Green Deal lay out, you know, it's almost like every month, there's a, some new communication from Europe about what they're gonna, what they're gonna do and what their next bit of the plan is. And of course, it's not just climate, it's biodiversity loss, a whole load of other, the oceans, etc. It's really impressive to see this global leadership coming out. And at the same time, the question is, when is it that we're going to see uh, the major energy companies really engaging with us? They are, they are engaging with it. And the question that many people have is, to what extent is that engagement lip service or to what ex extent are they really going to change? And, you know, how are you going to deal with Saudi Aramco, these super uh, oil producers, hydrocarbon producers, etc. And then, of course, the, you know, the big, the, the big numbers in terms of coal are uh, uh, America, um, uh, okay. India, Turkey, a fair bit. China is huge. China. It's China. absolutely huge. Of course, everything else. So you've got to get, and then of course, China talks about getting rid of coal um, and uh, power stations not building so many, mainly because of pollution and the effect it's having on their atmosphere. Um, whereas they're quite happy building them for the Belt and Road Initiative in other countries. So there's got to be, a, a, this has got to be taken to a, a, a much more serious level of really getting people to understand the, the grave urgency of what's happening. And we are heading to into, you know, not just um, uh, worsening climate, but uncharted waters in terms of understanding how the climate will respond. But based on previous times in the geological record, when we know climate CO2 was this high, it really looks grim. 
and we have to face up to the fact that we could be moving into this relatively quicker than it's ever happened in, in natural times in the past, um, uh, naturally in the past, uh, and in, you know, imposing huge shocks on our ability to deal with nature. And we all know how good we are at preparing for huge shock, shocks, you know. So um, I think we actually need to uh, really take a, you know, a serious sense of, you know, how we've dealt with COVID and how unprepared we were, despite all the, um, you know, the things that were said in the, you know, the past about getting ready for a pandemic, it's going to happen. We should all be worried about it and be prepared and how unprepared we were and how unprepared politically we were with every, every state, every country taking a different action, you know, and think about that in the context of what's gonna happen with climate change, which is gonna be far worse and for far longer. And it's going to be something where there's no vaccine or anything like that. And we're moving to a point where um, the climate system is gonna be in, some, in, some, in certain respects, irretrievable um, as we sort of accelerate forward. We've gotten to the 40 minute mark or just about past that and China has, just come up and I think it's time that we talk about it because it's responsible for as much CO2 emissions right now as the United States and Europe put together, in fact more than that. Um, it has made now finally a major announcement on um, its climate trajectory. Um, is this not an absolutely fundamental issue for Europe, also for the United States, um, going forward? I, and I'm kind of curious here, particularly Enrico perhaps, to hear your view because obviously this, this challenge, this shift in the Chinese position comes at a moment in which relations between China and the West, including Europe, have somewhat deteriorated. Italy has at various points adopted a line towards China that is rather different from other European states. Indeed, I believe the state of play is that Italy is a signed up member of One Belt, One Road. And it would be fascinating to hear your take on how you see Europe's relations with China going forward on this on this on this front. Yeah, it is crucial, and I see uh, one tool and one one framework, one opportunity next year, because next year uh, Italy will lead the G20, and the G20 is the only place where China and the UN and the US are there at the same table, uh, a small table, not the UN. Uh, General Assembly is a small table uh, and the G20 uh, in my uh, thought is, is a very important uh, place and a very important uh, institution. Um, it was crucial his role during the first crisis, the, the, cre the crisis that uh, uh, created the, the, the G20 because it was one of the consequences of the first of the previous crisis. And then uh, after the period of the, of the crisis last years where, and, and this year 2020, where years where at the end of the day, the role of G20 was not so important. I think next year can be important, first of all, because there's a new US administration and the, the 2G, the G20 and the G7 had a lot of problems with Trump in the Trump period, because of course, Trump was not, uh, a big fan of this kind of uh, meetings. Uh, so I think G20 can be an important, uh, uh, can play an important role next year. It is not by chance that the Italian presidency will put uh, uh, planet, uh, people and prosperity as the three key words of the program. Uh, at the same time is the year of the uh, Glasgow meeting and Italy will co-chair with the UK. So, I see there the possibility for Europe uh, through this uh, G20 relaunch to play a role to catch uh, China and to keep discussing and with, with them. Uh, of course, it depends also on many other issues, uh, technology issues, security issues, uh, and so on and so forth. And it depends also on the Biden's agenda on China. And mm -hmm. frankly speaking, it's not easy to understand but it's uh, maybe you can tell tell us something more on that. It is not easy to understand uh, whether uh, Biden's will uh, Biden's agenda will will be in continuity or not uh, with with Trump's agenda on uh, on China. But I have to say uh, that that this G20 topic for me uh, is is the key issue, is the key opportunity, also because it's the first 
opportunity to see if uh, multilateralism will will start again with the uh, new U.S. administration, and there's there a great opportunity, I think. If that is the forum uh, that Enrico has identified for us, uh, Laurence, if you were in the room and you had, as it were, command of the agenda, what is it the Europeans should actually discuss with the Chinese? What do you think well, should be the key agenda points for that for that conversation? And that conversation, of course, has started because you you remember when. Van der Leyen, in a way, when you have seen all the back and forth, and, and your paper was excellent, by the way, Adam, on, on all this, um, the discussion with China, of course, as, as the US-China discussion, was very tense in the preparation of the summit, the US-EU-China summit. It's the Leipzig. Have, the Leipzig. Yeah, so it's a Leipzig, which has been postponed and postponed and postponed. Of course, you have investment, you have the trade issue, you have, of course, uh, all the issue about technology, the human rights, and climate. And, uh, and, and that's why the, the standing up of, of Europe saying, we will do the Green Deal, whatever, whoever does whatever they want, we will not change, we will not depend on other decision to implement the Green Deal to the point that we may, we may use a trade instrument to be able to deploy the Green Deal fully. And then, uh, and so that was a stand that Van der Leyen very, very well, by the way, with Merkel and, and Michel did in the preparation of the July meeting where they have together. And Van der Leyen, and, and we have been preparing that with her, had in her hands the different scenarios that she could ask China to, to accept uh, with the views that at least on climate, that could be something that would be the sort of the peace place. Yes. the more peaceful place. And that, that why she put forward the 2060 target for, the carbon, for carbon neutrality. Of course, it was prepared because everybody knew in China the scenario was there. That's now many years there, people are working on that. So that was not a surprise for she, nor the different informal channels that have been really prepared to, to prepare that conversation. But I, I do think that for, for she, uh, it was of course damage control certainly, uh, the problem of the, the Chinese are from now, which I'm going to China every year, normally uh, since 2000, and the trade impact, the trade measures, the border tax adjustment for them, it's a nightmare. They just, they are afraid from this from 2000, maybe more, 20 years. So they see this coming. And then the third element, that's why they are now so excited about carbon markets, by the way, both internally and internationally. So this and, is just so our audience understands this would be a carbon price border adjustment, like a tariff, so as to penalize Chinese importers if they use cheap domestically produced power and they're importing into a Europe with a high carbon price. So to create a level playing field. Absolutely. Thank you for, because of course it's a little bit jargon already. No, 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 no. And, um, and the, I think the other element, uh, and, and I think we have seen that, the, not the failure, but in a way the bad result of BRI in terms of uh, uh, international soft power uh, of the debt issue, which is now mounting and increasing. And the fact that I suppose that the Chinese, go the Chinese leadership has bet on Biden election and didn't want to be pressured by US. So that was a mix of sort of variables. But this conversation then now is uh, and it has been, so first element, September, the announcement, China will be carbon neutral by 2060, which was the first demand. But then I see now, of course, a sort of a zone, a gray zone where China hasn't come with anything new in, in, at the summit in, on the 12th of December for the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. They so could have come with really an announcement of the, their new climate plan they didn't come with anything strong or, or even clear. It just the business as usual, mostly. So the question mark is uh, what now uh, EU has to ask, so the second step before Glasgow. And that's where now the discussion between US and EU are so crucial. If, this, if EU and US in a way decide on a trend of the economy that is converging, on the climate element, on, on, could be on transport regulation, let's see, standards of car, for example, that probably EU will decide by June, that will eliminate 
de facto the IC uh, cars for a certain date could be on the clean power. Again, a series of things that would, in a way, change the course of the global economy because that will have an enormous impact because that would be the two big markets. Then, so that's what one of the roots of the China policy on climate vis-a-vis -vis China could be a US through Brussels to China, which is one option I think is probably more reasonable if the two can team up before. So that's the problem of the agenda, the political sequence for Biden, because he will have a lot to do. And how, and in a way, a different sense that the Obama administration took, which Obama administration was not actually interested in European development. They were not interested in Europe. They were looking to Asia. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, the pivot that I don't know if Joe Biden would like to do. I've discussed that with Kerry recently, but, uh, so if they decided to do that, that really is, a, the, is an enormous leverage on China and we'll have China presenting a good plan in Glasgow in, in next November. But if we don't do that, I, I would be a little bit more pessimistic because again, China would then delay. But uh, so that's my, my take at, at that stage. Thank you, that, that's fascinating. Jason, I think the ball at this point is really in your court. We have two anxious, puzzled, concerned Europeans wanting to know what the next move is going to be. Obviously, we're just putting you on the spot here, but what's your read on the, the direction of travel of the Biden team? Yeah, well, I, I, don't, I don't know. As you say, uh, US and China combined are half of global, almost half of global emissions. So um, uh, a, a diplomatic dialogue and elevation of of, of climate ambition is essential in that relationship. It was, uh, you explained well in foreign policy, maybe you'll comment on it in a minute about why the 2060 announcement was important. And of course, everyone is looking for indications that things in the 14 five-year plan and 2030 targets will be meaningfully different and give some confidence that long-term targets uh, are real. There'll be some return to trade norms, I assume, of the WTO, and maybe that will help increase trade in, in energy and clean energy products, we're gonna need a lot more of that. But this is a very difficult and contentious relationship and that's gonna remain true under President-elect Biden on cybersecurity, intellectual property theft, unfair subsidies, um, political repression and human rights issues. So there are a lot of complicated issues to think through in what the US-China relationship is going to look like moving forward. And as Laurent said, there's an important element of um, of soft power in, in Belt and Road. Uh, President-elect Biden used somewhat strong language throughout the course of the campaign about BRI and, and explicitly kind of phrases like holding China accountable for its investment in coal projects through Belt and Road uh, outside of China. We don't exactly know how one would do that, but I think one tool the US has now in 2018 was the creation of the Development Finance Corporation, a more powerful version of its predecessor, uh, in part because you can't beat something with, with nothing if you wanna com complain about some of the geopolitical or environmental impacts of Belt and Road. There need to be um, efforts with multilateral finance to go into rapidly growing uh, South Asian or other emerging market countries and say, we can put a package on the table that works economically, uh, that, that makes sense from a financial standpoint and is cleaner, is lower carbon. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's an important area actually where the US and Europe can work together with multilateral finance institutions to think about what, uh, what that mm -hmm. would look like. I do think we've also seen some know. indications even from our incoming national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, he wrote a piece in foreign affairs recently about um, incremental like shifting towards something that looks a little bit more like industrial policy targeting certain US uh, in strategically important sectors. Clean energy would certainly be one of them and making sure that the US is competing uh, economically with China at the same time that we're finding areas to cooperate on things like climate or global pandemics or something else. That's an interesting dynamic, I think, because it's it's an interesting dialectic between cooperation and conflict, right? And it's quite difficult, I think, to decide in one's mind whether, since as Alex emphasizing, we don't have any time at all. Like, you know, we need a fix. We need rapid, not fix, we need dramatic change in the next two decades. And there's a sort of liberal principled mind which says, let's design the optimal framework for this. Let's build a better world around this kind of arrangement. 
And then there's another kind of pragmatist that says, no, we just need to do whatever it takes. I don't care about what the motivations are. We just need to get CO2 emissions down, full stop by any means necessary. Because if we don't, all the other bets are off, right? As Alex was laying out for us, this is becoming an increasingly unstable situation and the choices we'll have to make in disastrous situations as we've discovered this year are all terrible. There were just no good trade-offs at all. So with regard to China, even if, let's just say, I mean, my read is that they're serious about it because they understand that to preserve their authoritarian dictatorship, they need to stabilize the climate because it's gonna be incredibly difficult to do if they don't. And so that's why they're doing it. This isn't something that they're making liberal concessions, you know, the concessions to liberals in the West or trying to curry favor in fact, the, the kind of boot is on the other foot. They desperately need a fix for the problem of how they decarbonize big EMs, which are growing all around them and which they are stimulating the growth of. But wind away from that to this issue of competition, industrial policy, you know, isn't there, a, isn't there, I can't decide in my own mind the balance between as it were, thinking in terms of cooperative solutions and thinking what we actually just need is a free-for-all of industrial competition to give us the cheapest possible solar panels, energy fixes, the sort of thing we saw between Germany and China, where the Germans did a feed-in tariff and the Chinese ran an industrial policy that just dumped cheap solar on them. And in a sense, it's a win for the climate, right? It's what helped to drive uh, the energy transition in Germany such as it was. It isn't a perfect solution. It doesn't get you to the place that Britain's ultimately gotten to, but it's dirty, it's competitive. In my mind, what, what model do you prefer? Do you prefer a sort of competition of systems which has the net effect of achieving the kind of crash decarbonization that Alex is rightly insisting we need? Or should we think of this as part of a project of building cooperative global relationships, rebuilding multilateralism? Or perhaps that alternative is, is poorly posed. Perhaps that's a bad choice. I, the sense is we sometimes want all our, you know, we want to our cake and eat it at the same time. I, I don't know what others think, but I think it would be a, the combination of the two. Look at the uh, automotive industry. Yeah. It's a very fierce competition. And you've seen as a German industry has have shifted, the, the, the monster of Volkswagen VW has decided that there will no chance anymore for, for the traditional uh, car uh, engine for cars. So, uh, but, that, but at the same time saying it's now or never, if not, we will die because that's a Chinese, and that of course a Chinese plan so for the last five years. And so that's, it. in my view, the domain of competition. That's why I, I really think that if there is a, a convergence on some elements of what the decarbonization trajectory should be between US and, and, and Europe, and of course there are differences, but others, anyway, you have to electrify whatever things you can, you have to clean energy to have this clean electricity. So if you get through regulation, carbon pricing, whatever the instrument we use, but we, we, we just had this trend of the economy, which I think will not be linear because we will have crashes and, and of course, uh, crisis in some sectors. And um, I think the, the cooperative and the cooperative space will, will be allowed by this massive shift of the market. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very mixed model we will see huh? and a sort of tension back and fro, because again, the Chinese will have to face the debt they have issued and they know, and, and, and countries are not paying it, uh, and, and they will have to face that. I do think that in China, the discussion on the impact of climate change was sometimes very high in the political leadership and then very low. So, you know, it's a, it's a moving pieces as well. Huh? And when the different groups are pointing in different directions. So that's why I believe really, if there is a the signal from the market, from the companies, from the investors, from the governments, now we could have some kind of, of course, an alignment. Uh, I think that will be a res irresistible signal for, for China to be serious. Not they will not be serious, the problem is they are postponing the decision. Uh, as Jason was saying, when you look at what is on the table of the 14 five year plan, that's not consistent with carbon neutrality by 2060. So th that's exactly the discussion. But that's why it's so urgent. If the signal from US and EU are the same, and in a way, in a cooperative mode in this case, because we need that, we need that, because if not, we are not, so the, the weight is not the same. 
I think then China will come with something which is much more reasonable, and in particular on the coal pipeline. Alex, I see you've uncovered. Do you want to come in on this? Well, only I was just coming. I think that was a great answer, but I think the you know the, the whole thing of trying to incentivize and, and shift this this there's a chicken and egg problem with a lot of this stuff. So, for example, uh, getting an electric vehicle right now in New York is pretty much you know it's not a waste of time. But the fact is, there aren't any charging places on the streets and in the garages or whatever, and so they're actually you know the, the old-fashioned you know gasoline car is so much more practical. And so at some level, government, whether it's state government, city government, or, or national government, oh, can actually do a huge amount to, to catalyze this change. And the automotive industry is ready to make it. They're ready to, they're ready to pump out new, car, new forms of vehicles. Bentley's doing it. You know, of course, um, Volkswagen, as you say, there's lots of enthusiasm. The big manufacturers in America say they can move in that direction. But we've got to get the country to provide the infrastructure to really support this going forward. And I think that can make a, a massive change to the kinds of things people want to see in terms of at least part of the energy sector. It's a bit the same with decarbonizing buildings. Someone's got to step in and actually make this happen uh, at a government level, whether it's a state level or a city level or a federal level. Mm. Yeah, one of the optimistic signs that you can read it's underreported, I think, is that the European carbon trading system is actually beginning to bite right now. The yeah. price is over 30 euros a ton. Over 30 euros a ton, it really begins to hurt the poles. It's no longer a matter really of politics. It's a matter of whether you want to lose money making power or not. And if the European Union has the guts to progressively limit the supply of the allowances, we could see prices up at 70, 80 euros a ton over the next decade. And at that point, exactly the momentum that Laurence is talking about seriously begins um, to build. Maybe I, can, I, maybe I can end with this question. Indulge, we, we're, we're conscious of the flowing of time. Indulge a historian, Enrico, you kind of set me down this path. We need, as Alex was highlighting, this to be the turning point. Looking back at this 15 to 20 years from now, do you think this will prove to have been that moment? Um, because, Going into the year, I would have said that I felt pessimistic. I would have said I felt I understand the political economy of climate change, and it looks bad. There really isn't the energy, the force that we've been talking, as Alex was saying, for decades, and look at the emissions numbers. It's just not there. The action isn't there. And then I think I agree with Enrico that this year didn't turn out the way we expected. So that is, in my mind, you know, as the historian trying to, as it were, position our moment. It's my kind of emotional intellectual hedge against disaster is at least we get to tell the story of how this happened. Like, what, um, how do you evaluate this, this moment? Enrico, maybe I can start with you. Um, well, I, 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 think, I, I think I suggest you as a historian to, to work on the uh, three events uh, that the year 2020 had. The first event is the change in the US administration. And that is crucial, I think. The second one is the announcement by Chinese leadership. And I think this is the, the, the second one. And the third is about um, Europe. And about Europe, the key point is the public opinion switch. That is, for me, crucial. Uh, because as, as Laurence <clears throat> said, then politics uh, followed. But the true change happened one year ago, two years ago, in the, in the last in the last eighteen months, I think, at the level on, on the ground. Yes. It happened on the ground. Uh, we had the feeling that uh, in in daily life something had changed, and uh, in and that political parties decided to follow, countries decided to follow. Uh, I think the the youth movement was so important because you know we are at the same time having uh, the most dramatic increase of debt at world level in Europe. Because all this next generation and all <clears throat> the decisions that we took in the last months are decisions increasing the debt. And increasing the debt in uh, European countries means that we are asking the present youth to pay this debt in some decades. So 
I think the present leadership and the present generation in power uh, are thinking that there's a deal to make with the new generation. And the deal is, is a deal in which there's an increase of debt, so more uh, responsibilities for the new generation. So we have to be now responsible for climate uh, because they are, uh, they are asking for this uh, more responsibility. So I think for in, in Europe, it was a more complex deal, something that had public opinion, uh, voters on the ground to change. And that is, I think, fascinating. Uh, and uh, the three, uh, the three uh, moments were at the same time. And I think this is why I think this 2020 is so crucial. That's fascinating. I hate to correct you on the debt, but debt, uh, the American run up of debt is like no one else yeah. is on earth. <laughs> They're running an 18% of GDP deficit, according to IMF numbers. America's debt accumulation this year is that of all of the advanced economies and China put together. So it's, but it is a common problem. In other words, we are, as Alex was saying, doing things on a stupendous scale. The question I think is whether we can make them valuable in the long term. Jason, can I put you on the, the spot? Uh, when we look back at this year, do you think it will, at least in the American case, be opening to some fundamental, some fundamental shift? <laughs> There, there's certainly a shift happening, as I mentioned a minute ago, the importance of the role that this um, issue of climate change played in the in the political election. Alex and I see it on campus every day with the sense of urgency among the younger generation. And you see that in the polling on both sides of the aisle. I mean, they're starting from a different place, but the younger Demo cohort, you know, it, it, this is a much higher priority uh, issue than for, for older Republican, generation. Even amongst self even amongst self-identified Republicans, actually. Yes, no, no, that's true. The younger generation, this is a really important issue. It's changing. Um, I, this is um, a really important year for so many reasons. It, 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 another uh, event this year, it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day in the United States. And I think back to the first Earth Day in 1970, you know, that came at a moment when several decades of um, air pollution and water contamination, uh, lack of regulation of the industrial sector. People were breathing dirty air. There were signs saying, don't swim in this lake because it's polluted. You can't drink the water. It kind of all built to a, to a head, came to a head where one out of every 10 Americans across suburban and urban, across Republicans and Democrats came into the streets in April 1970 and said, we just can't live like this anymore. Someone, ha you have to fix this problem. So much so that the political pressure built on a Republican president, Richard Nixon, to create the EPA and the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act. I think we're moving in that direction with the sense of urgency around climate, but I'm, I'm not sure we're we're all the way there yet. I think there's there's still some more work to do to understand the urgency, not just the urgency, but understand, as Alex said, the scale of transformation required. I think that still needs to be better understood. We we when we talk about the energy transition, I think people often put a chart up showing something like zero to a hundred percent going back to 1850, and then you see these great transitions from wood to coal and coal to oil, oil to gas, increasingly renewables, although still quite small. If you look at that same exact data, not as a percentage of the total, but total energy use, right, BTUs, that's what the climate cares about, tons of CO2, we've never used less of anything. <laughs> we're using more of everything today than we did 100 years ago. And so everything we're talking about is a, an example of how we could see a clean energy addition, meaning we all the new energy demand, because energy demand is growing quite rapidly, is done with zero carbon energy. Um, we're still going to need massive amounts of negative emissions, given what the models show at this point, to, to meet you know some well below two degrees, because we've delayed for so many decades. Um, and then we, 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 we also need to confront the fact that 80% of the global energy mix today is hydrocarbons, and that has to come down quite a bit, but maybe some role for CCUS or something else. So we need to confront, uh, we were talking a lot about electricity just now. How do you put more renewables on the grid, right? Electricity is 20% of final energy consumption, about a, about a third of emissions. There's a lot that we can electrify, but we're not going to electrify all of it. We need more uh, innovation and hard to abate sectors. So there's just, we need to confront, I think, a little bit more, as Alex said, how, how, how not just more urgency, but then what it really means to take that urgency seriously. Thank you. Could I just ask Laurence and Alex to bring us home with a short, a short uh, yeah. retro view back from the future on 2020, Laurence? I, I, I think that, uh, I don't, again, I don't know, and, and Jason is right, uh, in fact, that 
the U.S. picture seems very, very difficult, but I, I understand that even the polls shows that there is a majority of, of U.S. citizens that are concerned. Maybe not the level of the 70s uh, for what the famous first day was, there was a million of people on the street, but still it's growing. But I, I do think, yes, I was very pessimistic in last March, uh, but, and of course very pessimistic about the crisis, uh, climate being on the back burner. And the, the response, the general response of we have to recover differently, we have to recover green, we it's just like not only in Europe, but everywhere, sometimes really it just lip service, sometimes it's a bigger element. So I, I do, and, and again, developments are not linear. The, the, the investment portfolio move against oil and gas company is not linear. It's not linear. And, and again, maybe that the shift and we have seen this year that the, the, the share values of the oil and gas companies going down, it's a, it's a massive element of, of in, as indicator. So yes, I would say that it has, it, it, it's maybe the, the year of the shift. Uh, again, I, I have no idea if we went win that battle. I'm not sure, of course, because we are just so late. But I, I do think that, yes, this year is, is certainly a shift. And that's why I was more optimistic about the resilience and impact of the Paris Agreement that I was uh, eight months ago. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, I mean, I just want to, I mean, I know I've been pretty uh, negative through most of this discussion, but um, the uh, the fact is, I, I I feel tremendously excited about the European Green Deal. I think it's fantastic to see a continent on the scale of Europe, with its you know its scale of its finances and uh, GDP actually taking this on seriously and a unified challenge. So I do think there's a score cause for optimism uh, that actually this will, of course, uh, move us in the right direction. I do think that there's cause for optimism now that. America's, you know, going to be turning back to the table, as it were. Um, but I think there's also cause for optimism because, you know, people recognize that there are opportunities. Um, there's, the, there's the young people wanting it, but there's actually also opportunities for people in the future in terms of new kinds of industries and jobs going forward. And, you know, although we, we really must think hard about those coal communities and all the rest of it, and, and thinking about what this will mean for them, this transition. But let's think about it in terms of jobs for those people and new opportunities for them that we can strategically target in certain sec uh, sectors of our economy uh, that will be built around many of the opportunities around um, new technologies. Negative emissions is massively important, as Jason said. We're not gonna get there without that. That's gonna require huge, large-scale infrastructure, super technology, uh, lots of you know opportunities for money to be made. Of course, uh, it's also going to require an ability to uh, move CO two around and bury it underground, and that is going to mean we're going to need to work with the oil and gas industry. They're the only people in the whole world who know how to do this, and so there's opportunity for taking them with us as part of that transition. So I do think there are there are opportunities to actually think positively about this transition. Um, but we have to work so incredibly fast um, that uh, you know I'm nervous that we're we're maybe feeling too comfortable about um, how things are going when we should be feeling pretty nervous and scared actually right now. So. Thank you so much for that that fascinating last round. It's been a really wonderful panel, a wonderfully rich discussion, so many interesting angles and perspectives. Um, conventionally, we would now ask for a vote of thanks and a round of applause. Thank you all so much. Um, I know Emmanuel wants to come back on for a final final word from him and news of uh, upcoming programs. Um, Emmanuel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Adam. Um, this has been a, a, a thought-provoking and illuminating uh, debate, discussion, exchange, dialogue, however you may want to call it. Um, sobering to hear you talk uh, about the huge challenge ahead of us. Um, you've provided great insights um, on the, the challenges, um, uh, carbon taxation and, and complex dialectic among Europe, the US and China. There are also signs of hope 
uh, thankfully, um, on the, the impact of shifts in public opinion, uh, new jobs in, in technology, uh, as we've just heard, and, and the fact also that carbon taxation is starting to bite in Europe. Um, so on behalf of the Alliance Programme, the European Institute um, and uh, the Columbia Global Centers Paris, I'd like to thank our panel, uh, Jason Bordoff, Alex Halliday, Enrico Letta, Laurence Tubiana, and Adam Tooze. I'd also like to uh, thank our co-sponsors. Um, uh, this event was co-sponsored by the Columbia Alumni Association, the Columbia Maison Francaise, uh, the Columbia University Libraries, the Institute for I of Ideas and Imagination, uh, the European Legal Studies Center at the Columbia Law School, the Grand Continent, La Maison de l'Europe de Paris, the Sciences Po American Foundation, the Erasmus Plus Program of the European Union, and the Advisory Board of the Paris Global Center. Our next event in this series will tackle the question, is Europe democratic? And it will be held on the 26th of January. We look forward to seeing you all then. In the meantime, happy holidays, stay safe, and thank you again.